Several years ago, man, this, this must have been back in 1984, but it left, uh, it left an impression upon me that will, that will never, ever leave me. I pastored a small church out in, on John Jen Road, and it was one Sunday evening, and, one, and every Sunday evening, this little precious little Pentecostal girl would come and visit our church. Girl, she was an older lady. She was probably then in her late 60s, early 70s. But just a precious, precious dear woman. Well, one night, um, we had a couple of people that just felt like they really had something they wanted to share. And so, of course, I, I'm, I always welcome that. And I, I, I often wonder why some of you don't have testimonies of celebrating Jesus Christ. And maybe you do, but I want you to know uh, you're, you're welcome to that any time. But anyway... We, we had a couple of people that just wanted to give testimony of the goodness of the Lord. And this little Pentecostal lady raised her hand. And she said, Bro Brother Mike. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, can, can I say something? And my first impression was, she's Pentecostal. Are we going to have someone who's going to speak in tongues and turn flips and dance and, and all these other things? And so... I reluctantly said, well, sure. And boy, did the Lord, did he, man, did he work on me. That little lady got up, and the first words out of her mouth was, oh, how I love the church. Now, she wasn't talking about our little congregation. She was talking about the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's Pentecostal, Methodist, Baptist, Baptist, whatever. It didn't, that's, she was just saying, I love the church. But when she said it, it just was so empowered by Holy Spirit that it cut right to my heart. And the Lord said, you hear, you hear what that sounded like? Did you hear that? Not, not what you hear. Did you hear what that sounded like? And I said, yes, Lord, I heard. Because there was such power in that it wasn't it wasn't in it wasn't in that audible I love the church. It was the power of that in my soul. It was so pure, so sincere, so precious. And the Lord really worked me over because he he, he said, Did you hear that? And I said, Yes, Lord, I heard it. He said, Can you say that? And I thought to myself, No. I can't. I can't. Because I couldn't have stood at that moment and said, folks, I want to tell you why I love the church. I couldn't tell you that. And I was ashamed of myself. And I was embarrassed. I, I couldn't hardly preach that night. I'll never forget it. It made a lasting impression upon me. But here's what I did do. Immediately after that, that very next day, I really began to search my heart and to ask me that same question the Lord asked me the night before. Do you really love the church? And if you do, then why? So here's what I want to do tonight. I, I want to share with you the things that, that and, and it can never be all of it because it's just too big. But I'm going to share with you a few things that I thought about that God impressed upon me when we dealt with this whole deal. Do you love the church? I know that we said we were going to start a series on Colossians tonight. But since then, I really believe the Lord is leading um, another direction. So before I share this message with you, I want to tell you what, what we're going to be doing. And I just ordered the material yesterday, so we may not have it next Wednesday. But how many of you know who Jeremy Camp is? Y'all know Jeremy Camp? 
Do you know the story of Jeremy Camp? Jeremy Camp, I think within the first year of his marriage as a very young man, beautiful lady, both love the Lord, lost his wife to cancer. And, and it, he really struggled with that. So. Kyle Eidelman uh, tells the story and has put together a small group study called I Still Believe. And if you recall, that's the title of one of Jeremy Camp's songs, I Still Believe. Well, it's a study of how he dealt with losing his wife. And um, so we're going to start that probably not next Wednesday because I don't know if, I, if the material will get here and I can prepare for it. But the following Wednesday we will. So two weeks from tonight we will start that small group study. It's about five weeks, and I'm going to ask us to commit to 35 days of prayer and devotion as we work through this small group study. It's going to be awesome. It, you don't want to miss this. It's going to be incredible. Now, so tonight, I want to share with you, my. this has become my rationale for why I love the church. First of all, turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and we'll look at a couple of scriptures one of them will be somewhat out of its context but the truth of what I'm sharing with you tonight is there in Ephesians chapter 5 and there are many 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 scriptures that we could reference but I'm just going to go here for tonight Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 1. Therefore be imitators of God. Wow. How do you imitate God? Well, <laughs> some of what I share with you tonight will be some of what it means to imitate God. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Dearly loved children. Children, dearly loved children of God. Do you, do you know that you are, if no one else in this world loves you, do you know that God loves you? Do you know that, church? He says, and walk in love as the Messiah, watch this, who loved us and gave himself for us, a, sacrifice, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Do, do you understand how much he loved you? How much he loves us? Enough? Enough that he would lay aside his holy robe of diadem, lay that aside, don the flesh of humanity, become what we are, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine a holy God leaving the glories of heaven, that perfect place that you and I can't even we, we can't even associate with. We, we have no idea how perfect, how glorious, how wonderful, how magnificent that place is in the presence of God. But for him to leave here and come to a, to a satanic world, to live, to live on a planet that belongs to Satan. Satan is the God of this world. And he left heaven and came here. But he did that for you and I. He didn't have to. But he loved us enough to do it. Turn to verse 25. <clears throat> verse, the, these first few verses, or these last few verses in uh, Ephesians 5 is talking about a relationship between wives and their husbands. 
But if you look at verse 25, he tells the husbands to love your wives. But here's what I want you to see. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So, so if we're to be imitators of God and he loved the church, shouldn't we love the church? Shouldn't we, church, love the church? What does that look like? To love the church as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Gave himself for us. The church. So let me tell you why I love it. First of all, I love it because of her worship. Now I know that worship is culturally conditioned. You may have grown up in a Catholic church and I don't really know a whole lot about how they worship. But I know it's different from what we do. You may have grown up in a Methodist church, and I don't really know what Methodists do in terms of worship, but I know it's somewhat different from ours. You may have grown up in that Pentecostal church, and I don't know all of what they do, but I know it's different from ours. What I'm saying is worship is culturally conditioned. And we normally worship according to the way we were raised, according to the way we grew up, right? That, that's just the way we do it, right? That's why those of you, that's why some of you who were raised up in a Southern Baptist church, you will die a member of the Southern Baptist church. Because you think that's the only way to do it. But maybe the Pentecost think that that's the only way to do it. Maybe the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopals, I, I, I don't know, but here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that worship is not about a style of music. It is not about the version of the English version of Bible that we read and study. It is not about the, 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 the organization. It's how your church is organized, whether it has elders and deacons or only deacons or only elders whether it's made up of women pastors or men pastors, has nothing to do with that. Here's what worship is. True worship, tr absolutely true, pure worship, regardless of what denomination you are, regardless of how you've been culturally conditioned in that worship. Here's what true worship is. True worship is the adoring, the adoring response. Of all that a believer is. To all that God is and says and does. It is celebrating Jesus. And the motive for that worship is a love for him as he loved us. And gave himself for us. And the power to worship and the power to do that is the indwelling Holy Spirit. So the, so the question is not, is he pleased with the style of worship that you engage? That's not the issue. That's not the question. The question is, regardless of how you worship, are you celebrating Jesus Christ and is he satisfied with your worship? Not is the pastor satisfied with your worship. Not is the person sitting in the pew next to you satisfied with your worship. But is Jesus Christ satisfied with your worship? Is he glorified? Is he honored? D do you see that church? And that's why I love the church. Because the church has the power the indwelling Holy Spirit, and possesses the motive to celebrate Jesus Christ for who he is. And that's worship. And it doesn't matter if you get up and raise your hands. It, listen, I don't care if you get up and jump pews. I don't care. I don't care if you turn backflips. I just want to watch you walk straight when you do. When you come back down and land on your feet, I want to see how straight you walk. Amen? 
So we, we shouldn't criticize people for the way they worship. We ought not to be paying any attention to them anyway. Worship is the audience of one. And that is a holy, holy, holy God who loved you enough to come from there to here and give his life for you. Boy, if we could just get a hold of that. Secondly, I love the church because of the word that she shares. What is the word that she shares? It is the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the word of life, eternal life. For we are all dead in trespasses and sin until we hear the gospel and we trust the gospel, the person of the gospel, Jesus Christ, and we are born again, we are, we are taken out of that darkness, that darkness, that spiritual darkness of eternal death, and placed into his glorious light where we are eternally alive. Not where we will be eternally alive, but where we are eternally alive. See, salvation, it doesn't wait on you to die and then it's given to you. Salvation happens in this life. And the church is the only one who has this message. Congress doesn't preach it. The schools don't preach it. Your workplace doesn't preach it. You may have individuals in the workplace that share it, but that's not their message. That is the message of the church. And so I love the church because the church is the only organism in the world that preaches and teaches the gospel, a life, eternal, saving message. Amen? That's why I love the church. But not only because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that any whosoever, anybody, any one person, Believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. But not only does he give life, and not only is it the word that, that, that shares the free gift of salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, it's the only place where we, where we understand a word that we can walk in constant fellowship. With the one who came from heaven and gave his life, we can walk in fellowship with him. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Not only does he tell us that we can have eternal life, but he tells us how we can live in this life. And that's the message in the gospel of the church. But the third reason is, is because of her fellowship of love. Hmm. Or at least it ought to be there, huh? Look at John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, look at verse 34. This is soon after, according to the Gospel of John, this is soon after Judas, um, his betrayal is predicted. And, um, and soon after that, in verse 34, he says, um, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. Now, how did he say he's loved us? Or, or how did he say we should love one another? Like he loved us. What, what, what does that look like? What does that mean? Is, is that not a sacrificial love? I, isn't that a word that says, I don't live for Mike Scott. I don't live for me. I, I live for every one of you. I live for the Lord, but in living for the Lord, I do that by living for you. My life is not mine. My life belongs to him. And, and the way the gospel works, it works in and through his people, indwelt by Holy Spirit, gifted to serve one another. 
Do you understand that, church? So if, if I'm to love like he loves me, then I am to sacrificially give my life to you. But the same can be said, the same is true, could be said of you, right? You, you, you're, you're to love one another by sacrificially giving your life to one another. Sometimes we can be so selfish, can we not? <clears throat> Let me tell you something that happened just a little while ago. And boy, it just, it just made my heart warm. I've watched how some of you love one another, and it, it's, it's incredible. I, you know the Meals on Wheels? We, we've got Meals on Wheels here. You know that? Because you know that if you, know that if you get down and, and you're not able to help your family and to cook and to feed, do you know that there are women here and some men who, who will cook and put, put meals together for those who are not able, who are hurting? Mm-hmm. I know every Wednesday we have meals that go out on wheels every Wednesday and take the people who are not able to get out. That's an awesome thing. That's an act of love. Amen? But just a little while ago, one of our very own people uh, sent out a text and said, I'm scheduled to work Sunday. And my husband is on call. And so the chances of him getting called out are not great, but it is possible. Now, I, I, she's a, she's a health care worker, so she's got to be at the hospital. He, he's on call, so he could get called out and have two little babies. And her request was, in the event that my husband gets called out. Is there anyone who might could kind of back us up? All of our backups are not available for this weekend. Is there anybody who can back us up? And in just a few minutes, one of our other said, I can back you up. Hmm. Yeah. And it just, they're in my Sunday school class. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with people who are just loving one another. You see, the love of God in the lives of his people is a powerful thing. Amen? It can touch and change, literally change the life of another individual. That's the power of God's love. And it is, the, the power of his love is lived out in his church. It's not lived out through the world. The world don't know anything about his love. The world doesn't, doesn't operate within the love of God, but the church does. Because we have indwelling Holy Spirit who gives us love and who motivates us and empowers us. To love people as we are loved. Fourth reason is because of the ministry she is capable of. Do, do you believe, church, that there is absolutely nothing that the church cannot do? Do you believe that? There is absolutely nothing the church cannot do. Do you remember back in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14 when the, the Israelites, they had, uh, Matt, would you crank that air, crank it up a little bit? I mean, not colder, but warmer. We got some people who are, uh, so I don't know if you crank it up or crank it down, but whichever, make the number go up. Thank you. So, Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. Israel had just come across, um, the sea, uh, the Red Sea, had made their way down into the wilderness of uh, Sin, who was on, uh, yeah, if you don't mind. So they're, they're there in the Sinai Peninsula, and they have made their way up to Kadesh Barnea. And Moses 
um, God picks a leader out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, puts them together in a unit together, and Moses gives them orders. He says, now, go spy out the land inhabited by Canaanites, wicked people, brutal people, haters of God. He said, go spy out the land, and, and, I, and I think it's an awful thing. I think it's a number. 13, I believe it's right in verse 1, where he tells them to go spy out the land, and he says that I have given you. It's already been, it's a done deal. I have given you this land. And so the 12 get together, and they travel up to the edge of the promised land, and they spy it out, secretly search it out, and it was told that it was a land of milk and honey and good things and great things, and, and uh, they saw all of that. As a matter of fact, I think they, they carried back a cluster of grapes that it took two men to carry. That's how awesome it was, pomegranates and all kinds of stuff. But they also realized that there were some huge people, warriors, men who lived in that land. They were the sons of Anak. And, and you recall, what, how, did, how were they described to whenever they brought the report back of the land they had spied out? What, what, how did they describe those people? They said that they are giants, that we are as what? Grasshoppers. Now I want you to get that picture. There's not a person in here that couldn't squash a grasshopper with just half of their foot, right? Not that you would. I'm not saying that you would. You accidentally step on him, okay? They came back, and they lied. They literally lied about what they saw because there were not men who were able to squash an Israelite man on the bottom of his foot. So they lied about it, did they not? But here's what they did. They struck fear in the hearts of the Israelites, so much so that they said, oh, we, we, we're afraid. We can't do it. Now, God's already said, I've given it to you, but they said, oh, we, we can't do it. I fear that there are churches, maybe even us, that have in our heart and our mind, we put limits on God. And we've said, God, you're, you're great and you're big, and, but I don't think you're quite big enough to help us accomplish the goals or the visions that you have set before us. Now, I can tell you what one of the, what one of the goals are that, that God has given us. You want me to tell you what it is? It won't be anything new. You already know. I can tell you what it is. It's the win Grand Cane to Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, does it go beyond that? I'm sure it does. But first and foremost, he said, you'll be witnesses unto me in both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost. And our Jerusalem is right here. Amen? And so let me ask you something. What are we doing to reach people right across the street over here? What are we doing, people to reach, doing to reach people right across the street over here? What are we doing to reach people that live over there next door to Lily? So, oh, we're saying that's Lily's job? Yeah, it's your neighbor. Handle it, handle it, handle it. But do you understand... But, but you see, we, we, we use excuses and we think that we can't do it. But we can do it. I, anything God puts before you, he will enable you to do it. If he wasn't going to enable you to do it, he wouldn't put it before you. And God planted Grand Cane Baptist Church here however many years ago, but one of the goals of this church was to be reaching Grand Cane with the gospel. I love the church because of the ministry that she's capable of, and the ministry that we are capable of is anything God gives us. 
because he's the one that makes us capable. He gives us strength and provision to accomplish it. The fifth thing, and I hope I'm not boring you, these are just things that I've thought about. The fifth thing is the significance that she gives to those who get involved. The significance that she gives to those who get involved. And I'm talking about who get involved with the, the ministry. If you really thought about this, and I kind of I, I kind of hit on it Sunday, and I'm, I apologize. I, I did a horrible job Sunday, and and so I don't I don't think I made my point. But he, part of that was this: we're, we're we're just sinners, amen, saved by grace. But we're not poor, old, pitiful, wretched sinners. That's what Satan says. Satan says, you're rotten to the core. He says, you're no good. Satan says, you, you, you can't possibly be saved. You think that, said that, did that, went there? You can't possibly be saved. Ain't nobody saved would ever do that, say that. That's impossible. But let me tell you something. When you sin, Jesus says, Jesus says, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse of all unrighteousness. Listen, do you, do you understand? You are a son, a daughter of God. You are an adopted son or daughter of God, almighty creator, God. That's who we are. We're not just some poor, pitiful, wretched, uh, uh, un, well, we might be undeserving, but, but we're you know, we're not just scum. We're, we're children of God, bless God. We're heir and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We, we need to remember who we are in Christ, not be puffed up about that, but because it's all glory to him. Amen? It's because of him. But, but we need to see who we are. We, we, we're not just trash. We, we are valuable to him. And God chooses to live in us and to work through us. That's an incredible, awesome thing. Amen? And I, now, if I was God, I wouldn't have done it that way. I wouldn't have done that. I know how dumb I can be sometimes. I know, I know, I know how fallible I am. I know that. I wouldn't have done it that way. But he did, and he's God. Aren't you glad he is and you're not? Amen? Word says we, we, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Listen, before, before God even created the world, he, he knew you and he chose you. you you're somebody in him. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't even know how to articulate that. But I love what Paul said in Philippians 1, 6. Is that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until the day God calls you out of here. My friend, listen. He started to work in you from before the foundation of the world. And he is doing it right here, right now, this very night. And the only obstacle is you. The only obstacle is me. Because God is a gentleman and he will not impose upon you. He wants you, he wants you to allow him to work in your life. To be all that he wants you to be. But he wants you to do that willingly. I'll close with this one. No, I won't. <laughs> I just thought of something else. I, I love the church because her future's secure. <laughs> the, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, you remember when Jesus questioned his disciples, he said, who do men say that I am? Some of them said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the other prophets, this or that, one thing. And then Jesus said, yeah, but yeah. yeah but, 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 but who do you say that I am? An old 
foot in his mouth, bumbling, stumbling Peter, came up with the right answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did Jesus say? He said, he said, you're right. He said, and you're Peter. You're, you're the rock. And he said, upon this rock, this faith that Peter expressed of who Jesus was, the belief in who he was, the understanding of who he was, he said, I'll build my church. And then he says, what? The gates of hell, what? Will not prevail. Didn't say it wouldn't come against, because we know he will, but he won't prevail. Amen? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We might fight some battles that come straight out of hell, but if you've read the last book and the last chapter and the last verse, we win. <laughs> had, had a man come into my office the other day, and, and he's mully-grubbing about how bad things are and, and just pitiful, and I'm starting to get depressed. And so I finally said, you're depressing me. What do you mean? I said, man, listen, let me, let me tell you something. Have you ever thought about this? We are living in probably the greatest generation, at least it's been the greatest generation of my lifetime, and I'm knocking on 70. It ain't going to be long. I'm going to be there. <laughs> Just a few more months. I hate to say that, but that's true. But anyway, I'm almost 70 years old, and we're li I'm living in what I think is the most exciting days of my life. Why? Because I think the end is near. I think I'm going. I'm. I think I'm going to see. I think I'm going to be alive when I when the trumpet sounds and I hear the voice of the archangel and I take my flight and I am forevermore in the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm not even worried about dying when I get after seventy years. Old. I'm not even worried about that. I don't think I'm going to die. That's how close I think it is. And you say, well, that's kind of naive to believe that. You've been hearing that all your life. You're right, I have. I have been hearing it all my life. But I've never really, I've never really walked around looking up. But you know what? I'm walking around looking up now. Because I really believe I'm going to see it. Now, you might not. That's okay. That's all right. But I believe I'll see it. I hope I do. Listen, I'm not afraid to die. I, I dread the journey, <laughs> but I ain't afraid of the end because I know where I'm going. And it's not because I'm good, it's because he's good. It's because he's, he's right and he's good. But I love the church because of her future. Turn over just a few pages to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then I'm going to show you one illustration and we'll, I'll, I'll be quiet. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep. And you understand that he's talking about those that have died and gone on before us. They're, they're not dead. They're asleep because they don't die. Amen? They don't die. They're, they're just asleep. So that you will not grieve like the rest. Those who have no hope. <laughs> kind of like. People that come mully grubbing, but like those who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you believe that? Say amen. amen. For, he says, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the apostle. We say this to you by revelation from the church. <laughs> no. This is by revelation of the Lord Jesus himself. This is God who said this. He says this is a revelation that we got straight from the Lord. He said, 
we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord, and therefore encourage one another with these words. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to encourage you. We're living in an exciting time. Think about all the junk that's going on in our world right now. I've never seen this kind of junk going on in our world. I've seen crazy things go on. I remember the Los Angeles riots. Y'all remember that? I, I remember the, the Vietnam War protests and all that junk that went on back then. I remember all that. But I don't remember, I don't remember a world in chaos as it is now. And, and all of the junk that they're talking about now, well, anyway, I don't want to get off into all that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you've been watching the news, we're living in an exciting time. Things are about to get so difficult that you and I can't fix the problem. See, right now, we think we can fix our problems. We think we can, and sometimes we can. But the world's getting in, a, in such a condition that man can't fix it. So who, who's going to have to fix things? Mm -hmm. Just saying. Turn to chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to show you something. I don't know if, if there's, an, a there, there's a church out there that you, would, that you would like for Grand Cane Baptist Church to aspire to be like. But if there's one in any part of Scripture, this is the church that I want to look like. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice what he says in verse 1. Paul Savanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you I want to be a I want to be a member of a church that's a church that's full of saved people that's what he's saying you know how I know that because he said he says to the church of the Thessalonians in God in Christ Jesus everywhere in the in the New Testament scriptures Anywhere you see the phrase in Christ, it is a reference to being born again and in him, taken out of darkness and placed into his glorious light. Jesus said in John chapter 10, he said, he said, my father, which gave them to me, he said, he said, I have them in my hand and no man is able to pluck them from my hand. I want to be a part of a church that is in the hand of God. Verse 2, we always thank God for all of you, remembering you're constantly in our prayers. I want to be a member of a praying church. Amen? A church that prays for one another. Now, I know there, there's some people that get weary about all the prayer requests that come out over the prayer chain. Oh, my goodness, another prayer request. I can't pray for all these people. Yes, you can. As soon as you hear the name, you pray. And then whenever God brings that person to your heart and your mind, you pray again. We got people that pray for every name that's ever mentioned. And I thank God for them. I want to be a member of a praying church. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work of faith. Remember what I said about the church? We work. Your work of faith. Listen. Listen. Paul said in another place, anything that is not of faith is what? Is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So that means that whatever we do, we do it through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your work of faith, your labor of love, I talked about love a while ago, and endurance of hope in the Lord Jesus, that is, in spite of all of the problems that we see going on around us, we just keep on keeping on. Don't quit. It may get tough, but don't quit. 
It, it may get a lot tougher than it is now, but don't quit. I want to be a part of a church that endures, endures of hope in our Lord Jesus, knowing the election, brothers, brothers loved by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and Holy Spirit and with much assurance. You know what kind of men we were among you for your benefit, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. There's that word of being an imitator of God. I want to be a member of a church that imitates God. Imitator of the Lord, when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from Holy Spirit, and as a result, you became an example to all the believers in Grand Cane. You became... Examples for all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the Lord's message rang out from you. I want to be a part of a church that's not ashamed to proclaim the gospel. I want to be a member of a church that's not ashamed of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That will go and tell it. Listen friend. How many festivals does Grand Cane have every year? Several. Grand Cain ought to be at every one of those festivals, and, we, and, and our message ought to be the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ so that everybody in Grand Cain hears the word. But in every place, your faith in God has gone out. Therefore, we don't need to say anything for they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you and how you turned. Watch this. Paul's saying, <laughs> we, we went into your area and everybody we tried to share the gospel with, they said, oh, we, we've already heard that. Your people have already been here. We know Jesus Christ. Paul said, we, we didn't have to say anything. Y'all done been there. This is Paul the Apostle saying to the church at Thessalonica, the church, you've been faithful to be there to share the gospel. And then he says, watch it. You remember I was talking about the, the power that the church has and the power of love and how powerful love is, the love of God in and through the life of a believer. Notice what it says. What kind of reception we had from you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God and true God. In other words, they turn from idolatry. From, from bowing the knee to false idols and images and junk and stars and moons and suns. And they turned away from that. They repented of that. And turned to faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And then he says, and to wait for his son from heaven. What, what, what did I say about the church's... Security, the church is secure. Why? To wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. I'd say the church is pretty secure. You want to know why I love the church? I just told you. I love the church. I really do. And it crushes me to hear people talk bad about the church. Don't do that. The church is the bride of Christ. And there's not a person in here that would appreciate somebody talking about their bride or their husband. You wouldn't appreciate that, would you? I don't care how sorry your husband is. Or I don't care how sorry your wife is. You may say something negative about them, but I guarantee you wouldn't appreciate anybody else. Amen? And I just kind of have a feeling because the church is the bride of Christ, Jesus really doesn't appreciate people talking bad about his bride. Does that mean that everybody in the church, everybody that is in the church is born again and loves the Lord? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But I guarantee you, if the church is there, there's some people there that love God with all their heart. There is a remnant. Amen? And that's the people that God works through, is his remnant his remnant of believers who love him and who love others. And that's why I love the church. 
we got a lot of we got a lot of warts, don't we? Well, I'll I'll just speak for me. I, I got a lot of warts, <laughs> and and uh, it took you a while. Some of you, I hid them for a while, but ev eventually you were able to see them. And the ones that you ain't seen, just give it some time. You'll see them yet, because I got a lot of them. But in spite of all my warts, I'm a child of God. Not because of what I say or because of what I do. It's because what he says, because of what he did. Amen? Question or comment? Well, I hope you're encouraged. Wow. Amen. Especially in a time where there's so much trouble. That's the power of God's love working in and through his people. Good to have y'all with us tonight. Some of our my oaky uh, comrades. So I'm not, see, there's three of us here tonight. Let's pray.